Greetings. My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. This morning at the beginning of the, or at the second service, we're going to have three individuals follow the Lord in believer's baptism. It's three uh, young adults recently that we've led to the Lord, had the opportunity to pastor Zach and myself, different ones there. We've had the opportunity to lead them to the Lord. And, of course, the Lord is the one that's called them to salvation. I can't save someone. You can't save someone. All we can do is be a mouthpiece that God can take us and we can share the truth. And the Bible says it's the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that in today's passage of Scripture. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks to someone's heart, that opens up their eyes. You know, sometimes we talk to people and we think, you just don't see, do you? You know why? They just don't see. Until the Holy Spirit opens up someone's spiritual eyes, they don't understand. And of course, you remember that. I remember that experience. When He does open up your spiritual eyes, and then you begin to actually realize a lot of different emotions Oftentimes, the emotion is crying. You don't have to cry to be saved, but oftentimes people do cry when they accept the Lord because I think there's a couple of reasons. One, they're overwhelmed maybe with their sin, the reality of their sin, but then also once you will finally make that step and step out from your pew and come forward and, and make it public and all of that, it's like a million pounds, isn't it, that is lifted off of you and I remember that way even when I was yielding to going to the ministry. I struggled with it for 12 years. And I remember on a Sunday night my pastor preached, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And suddenly I realized that night there was not going to be a voice out of heaven. There was not going to be lightning across the sky. God had already told me what he wanted me to do. He had just been waiting on me for 12 years to be obedient. And I remember that night I hadn't told Tammy. Matter of fact, I, we'd been married for five years, and I hadn't even told her that God was calling me into the ministry. And I remember that Sunday night I went forward, and I knelt down at the front of the church, and I cried and I cried. And it wasn't that I was sad. It was like, I, can't, I almost cry right now thinking the enormous amount of weight that was finally taken off of me that night as I yielded my life to God. Acts chapter 8 is one of my favorite portions of Scripture, especially uh, when it comes to the subject of baptism, people accepting Christ and being baptized. In Acts chapter 8, verse 26, we'll drop down into the passage. And it says, The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Or actually, it doesn't mean there was actually sand there. It means it was a very sparsely populated area. There was a major trade route that ran along the Mediterranean Sea, if you can vision in your mind, probably not, but anyhow, along the Mediterranean Sea, there was a major trade route that ran along the coast, and there would be other roads that would come into it, and and. Philip had been in the northern part there ministering in a region called Samaria. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord spoken to Philip, told Philip to go south toward the south to the way which goeth from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. As best we, on this trade route, best we can understand, this major trade route ran along the Mediterranean Sea. And then there was a road that came from Jerusalem that intersected at one point, And apparently he, the Spirit directed him to go somewhere near that point. Verse 27, Philip arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot and reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. First of all, let's talk about who Philip was. There are two or three different men mentioned in the Bible, the New Testament, with the name of Philip. We know that there was one Philip who was the brother of Andrew and one of the twelve disciples, but this is not him. 
There was another Philip that we learned from Acts chapter 6 that was chosen by the, the church at Jerusalem to be one of the original seven deacons in that church. The Bible says that his job description, along with the other men, was that they were full of wisdom. They were full of the Holy Spirit. They were godly men that the rest of the church really just respected them just by their character among the people. And this is that Philip. And it's that Philip who was one of the first original deacons in that church. Later he was called Philip the Evangelist indicating that this man had a special ability, a special calling from God, and a special ability to present the gospel. This is that Philip, and he was a unique kind of man. Because look up in verse 5 here of Acts chapter 8. It says, then Philip went down. Really means he's actually going north, but he's going down. How do you go down when you're north? Well, Jerusalem was up on a mountain. So when it's saying going down, it means going down in elevation here. Philip went down to the city of Samaria, which was actually north of Jerusalem there, and preached Christ unto them. Now what's amazing about that? I'll tell you what's amazing, because the Jews hated the Samaritans. They, the Samaritans, for the most part, were a mixed race of people. The Jews looked upon them and despised them. It's been said that a Jew would cross, go out of his way. He'd cross the Jordan River and walk up the other side of the Jordan River to go north up into the region of Galilee. He would not go through Samaria. And that's why probably when Jesus it says there, Jesus must needs go through Samaria there in the Gospel of John, I'm sure that it must have raised the eyebrows of his disciples. Probably it was the first time they had ever been in Samaria. Well, Philip, here in this early church at Jerusalem, He's a deacon. He's a godly man. He's an evangelist. He has this burden on his heart to share the gospel. And the Holy Spirit somehow speaks to Philip and sends him to a city of Samaria. He's probably the first missionary in the church. He's the first individual probably who actually took this upon himself to realize that the gospel is for more than us four. <laughs> You know, as you read Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus had a plan. He says, you'll start in Jerusalem, your hometown. Then you'll begin to branch out into Judea, the region around you. But some of you I'm going to call into Samaria. Some of you I am going to call to take the gospel to places probably you naturally wouldn't want to go. I'm going to send you because it's not about you. It's about me. And it's about you being my disciple and being obedient to me. And so when the Spirit spoke to Philip and told Philip to go to Samaria, Philip was such a unique man that he went. There's no argument. He went to Samaria, and the Bible says he preached Christ unto them. And there was a great spiritual awakening there in Samaria. Many people came to know the Lord as their Savior. You know, I like Philip. That's why I like to preach. That's probably the third or fourth time I've preached on this passage since I've been here at Twin Oaks. And I think one of the things I like about Philip was that Philip was a man who was able to overcome his natural prejudices and barriers. And he was able to, if you will, step outside of the box and let God use him in whatever way that God wanted to use him. Philip was a man that was not threatened by change. He was not threatened by something new. He kind of took it as an adventure, and he trusted God, and he stepped out in faith. And he stepped, it was a huge step of faith. I'm telling you right now, it was a huge step of faith for Philip to leave the church at Jerusalem, which was now several thousand people, and to go to Samaria. It was a huge step for him to go to Samaria, and no doubt, if he told others that he was going to do it, I'm sure there were some in that church that said, now wait a minute, Philip, don't you know God can use you right here? You know, we got a Sunday school class, and we could use you right now. Philip, and praise God for Sunday school classes. But then, the reason I say that, because I remember when God first started calling me into the ministry, and I began to express to my own parents, I love them, I began to express to my own parents that God was calling me, and that's what they told me. Well, Terry, God can use you right here, and he did. But yet, I don't know how to explain it to you. When God's got that hook in you, he's got that hook in you. And that's what he was doing there with Philip. And he called him to step out of the box. He called him to go to Samaria. He took his great adventure. He was open and sensitive to the Lord's leading. I think one of the things that made Philip such a, an effective tool for God is, number one, that he was obedient to the will of God. 
Wherever God sent him, he went. He just immediately, there was no argument, there was no delay, there was no reasoning. He just, just wouldn't you, what could God do with us if he had such control over us? What could God do with us if, if actually in the parking lot at Walmart, he'd say, go join thyself to that person and share with him the gospel? Or what could he do if he's a co-worker? Go ahead, do it. Talk with them. My dad was the mailman. And I'm in the ministry today because my dad was unsaved. He was the mailman because somebody in that community invited my dad to church. And my dad took his family, the mailman, took his family to church. And my dad accepted the Lord. My brother accepted the Lord. I accepted the Lord. My mom rededicated her life. I met my wife. And the, I mean, that was the open door. A lot of times we want God to show us what His will is, but we want it like multiple choice. You know, God, show me what your will is, and then I'll get back with you and let you know whether or not I think this is cool. You know, can I tell you something? God doesn't work that way. That is not faith. That's sight. God says, son, I'm calling you to step out of the boat. Step out of the boat. Do it. And it's not just going, it's every step of your, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you want to please God, get ready to take steps of faith. And that's what Philip did. And Philip realized that God was no respecter of persons. Philip realized, even as Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is like the wind, meaning that the Holy Spirit moves according to his own will. No one can determine where he came from, where he's going, where he's going next, what he's doing. The Holy Spirit is free and independent of us. He does according to the Father's will. And so Philip, therefore, was submitted to the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you something. Philip experienced God. Philip was one of the individuals, one of the lucky individuals in life that was able to get over his fears and step out and experience God. I think back to my life now and I think of if, I mean, I struggled with it for 12 years, brethren, just that one step of going into the ministry. And I think now what God has done, not just through my life, but through Tammy's life and through my daughter's lives and they're in the ministry. And I mean, it's just and see, God has just got such a wonderful plan that he wants to unfold for each of us if only we will trust him and take that step of faith. One of my favorite authors is Henry Blackaby. Henry Blackaby has a quote in a book called The Man God Uses. Henry Blackaby says, God is known for taking the ordinary and making it extraordinary. Throughout Scripture, God used ordinary men to affect his kingdom in extraordinary ways. Can I share a little something personal here about, you're my church family. This blows me away. Back in 1994, when we were in Ohio, one of my friends that was on the ministry there, he was the youth pastor, he encouraged me to try to start writing a daily devotional. Well, I thought, well, I don't even know how to do that. And he tried to show me, and I started trying to do that. So back in 1994, I tried to start doing that. And that's actually how I've learned a lot of my theology, my understanding about God, uh, is writing those. And then I, I did it for about seven years in Ohio. I got them all in a book there, and then I stopped doing it. And then I was here for a few years, and about four years ago, I approached Tony Quist, and I said, Tony, is there any way I can do this on the Internet? And he helped me develop this blog. I don't know who came up with that name, blog, but anyhow, he helped me to, in, to you know, develop that, and I started writing that. And as of today... I'm right at, I looked at this morning, I've written in the last four years, right at 1,400 daily devotionals. But here's the thing that blows me away. Pharaoh is out in the middle of nowhere, right? All of God's people said amen. You know, we're just out here in the middle of nowhere. I know for a fact that people in India and in Europe and in uh, Egypt, are people around the world Read my daily devotionals. The first day I saw that somebody was using me here in Ferrum to encourage a believer in India, I cried. I thought, oh, dear God, I never dreamed in all of my life that I would have, the, I can't wait to meet that person when I get to heaven. Seriously. It's amazing what God will do if we're just 
trust Him. And listen, you can't start out with your own ambition. You just got to be obedient. And probably what God's going to give you to do, you're sitting right now saying, I can't do it. Because if you can do it, God won't get the glory. So God's saying, I want somebody who says, I can't do this. But God says, oh, yes, you will. Trust me. I'll give you the, pain, the strength. I'll open the doors. I'll enable you to do this. Philip was that kind of man. Verse 6 of this passage says, And the people with one accord there in Samaria gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were there possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and they that were lame and healed. And notice what it says in verse 8. And there was great joy in that city. Boy, Philip was experiencing God in a great and a marvelous way in his life. But then in verse 26, again, it says, And then one day the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Now, Philip, right in the midst of all of this, arise and go toward the south unto the way which goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is a deserted kind of place. And so he arose and he went. Let me interject, having no idea why or what was going to happen. No promise. Had no idea. Would you, would you leave all that you have right now to go to a deserted place? Would you trust God that much to walk away from it and, and go to a deserted? And it's a matter of trust. It's a matter of faith in God. The only reason Philip did what he did is because he had faith in God. He trusted the Lord, that the Lord had a plan. Even if it didn't make sense, he trusted that the Lord had a plan. And so the Bible says, he arose and he went. And behold, while he's standing there, verse 27, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. What kind of entourage do you think that Ethiopian eunuch had around him as he's traveling through the desert? I mean, it wasn't just one little chariot with two horses in front of it. There probably were people running along the side, fanning, you know, ostrich feathers. And I mean, it must have just been a flamboyant kind of parade. This guy is in charge of the money in Ethiopia. What an amazing thing. Yet the Bible says, why was he traveling that way? Well, the Bible says he had been in Jerusalem, a man from Ethiopia, get this, had been in Jerusalem to worship the Jewish God, Jehovah. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Why had he gone to Jerusalem to worship? Well, I personally, I believe, I don't know this for sure, but I believe very possibly this man was actually of Jewish descent. Daniel, right? Daniel was in Babylon. He was a Jew. Joseph in Egypt. He was a Jew. You find several occasions in the Bible where God took some of his people and he put them out in strategic places around the world because God was wanting to bring the gospel, the good news. And let me tell you something here about Philip. This is exciting to me. Philip not only had the, had the courage to go into Samaria, but because Philip had the courage to go into Samaria, because Philip had the commitment to follow the Lord into a deserted kind of place, Philip not only is the first one to go to Samaria, Philip is the first one to be able to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Man, what Philip was able to experience through God. This Ethiopian eunuch is going to accept the Lord and take the gospel back into Ethiopia, into Africa. All because this one man by the name of Philip is yielded to God, letting God use him in a great way. Verse 28 says this man was returning and he was sitting in his chariot and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. He was reading the most prophetic, messianic piece of scripture. This, this is the passage of scripture that talks about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 is what he's reading. Isn't that a coincidence? Isn't that a coincidence that Philip happened to meet that guy there that day that he was reading Isaiah 53? If you're listening, you are, that is no coincidence. That's God working. I love what Henry Blackaby teaches about in experiencing God. 
He says, what we need to seek is to join God where he's already working. God doesn't send us out as pioneers to do something. And God says, you know, I never thought about that before. Okay. No, God says, listen, I am working over here. Will you come? Will you come? I, I've got people here that are hungry. Will you, will you let me use you today in this kind of way? Oh, the power of God that this man is reading Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For she shall grow up before him <coughs> as a tender plant and out as a root of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into our own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what this dude is reading. Don't you know God is all over him? Trying to understand. And he says... Verse 30, Philip ran thither to him and heard the prophet Isaiah and he said, understand us what thou readest. And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? Would you talk with me about this is what he's saying. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him in the place of the scripture which he read was, he was taken as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb or like a sheep before his shears is dumb so he openeth not his mouth. And his humiliation and his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and he began at the same scripture and he preached unto him Jesus. What a wide open door Philip had at that point. You know something? The Lord was calling this man to salvation. The Lord had moved upon this eunuch to go to Jerusalem to worship. Albert Barnes says in his commentary that possibly he had gone to Jerusalem for the Passover, which had not been that long before that. Very possibly this man had actually been in Jerusalem. And if he had not seen the crucifixion, he at least heard that this man, by the name of Jesus, had been crucified. God had placed in this man's hands the book, the word of God, Isaiah 53. God was causing this man to search and to question and God sent to this man someone that could answer all of his questions. The Bible says Philip preached unto him Jesus. What did Philip preach that day to this man? Well, we don't have the entire message. Let me share with you what I think might be at least two or three parts of that message. Number one, I believe that Philip preached to this man that Jesus, Jesus, whom you've heard was crucified, is the Son of God. He wasn't just a victim. He wasn't a radical, a fanatic, a teacher trying to make a name for himself in this world. He preached to this man that Jesus is the Son of God who was sent to this earth. You say, how do you know that? Well, look at the end of verse 37, the profession of faith of this man. He says at the end of verse 37, after Philip has preached this message, this eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why is that important that people understand that? Well, Christ's character had been in great question, you know, even as he was being crucified, men stood there and mocked him. It's often been said that Jesus was one of two individuals. Either he was a lunatic or he was the Son of God only two options you got. Most people in Jerusalem were saying that he was a lunatic. He had a bunch of lunatic followers. And Philip preached to that man that Jesus is the Son of God. Why is it important that people understand that Jesus is the Son of God? Because the Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so therefore, there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to save ourselves. What's, people say there are many different religions in the world. There are only two religions in the world. There's one religion that says you need to straighten up and do something so that you'll be worthy to go to heaven. 
or the other religion says you are incapable of doing it and God had to do something for you. That's what separates Christianity from all the others. You, Christianity is not based upon get better. Walk the straight and narrow way. Earn your way to heaven. That's not true Christianity. Christ, true Christianity is, is that you've sinned and come short of God's glory. You're not even searching for God on your own. Even your desire to want God has to come from God. It's all based upon the grace of God. The man asked me, he says, who's he speaking about here? He says, well, he's Jesus. It's Jesus. Who's Jesus? Jesus, he said, is the Son of God sent to this earth, number two, to be the Savior of the world. And Philip explained this. Look at verse 35 again. The Bible says that Philip opened his mouth and he began at the same Scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Listen to me carefully, Christian. It's been said that you can find Jesus on every page of Scripture. That might be difficult to do. But I believe that if, listen, what I've learned in life and witnessing the people talking to people, if you will just feed the conversation enough and keep them going and listen long enough, they will open the door for you. If you can get people to talking about it, sooner or later you will hear them and if you'll be praying in your heart as you're talking to them about it, they will say something in some way. They'll talk about death. They'll talk about heaven somehow in that conversation. And you've got to initiate that conversation many times. But they will open the door. And when they open up that door, listen, it, Jesus won a woman to the Lord at a well. Talking about water. Jesus talked about bread. He talked about light. He talked about sheep. You bring up this conversation, Jesus said, and I'll turn it into salvation. And Philip understood that the Holy Spirit was working in this man's life and using this particular portion of scripture and Philip said well let's just take a look at it and let's just see what it has to say and the Bible says that he taught him from this that Jesus is indeed the savior of the world you know Jesus was trying to share this with Nicodemus one night you know the verse of scripture is probably the most famous verse of scripture in all the Bible Jesus said for God so loved the world that he gave who his only begotten son Jesus was not a religious, I know you know this, but Jesus was not a religious leader. Jesus was not a man who gathered a following and tried to set an example for us. Jesus is God who came to this earth and took upon himself human flesh so in the flesh he could die for our sins. That's who Jesus is. The Son of God became the Savior of the world. And what a miracle that is. And Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I'll tell you a third point that Philip must have preached to this man is this. Salvation is a personal decision that each of us must make. Jesus said the same thing when he's talking to Nicodemus. For he said, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Salvation is a personal decision that each of us must make to come to that point to what we believe in Jesus, who Jesus is, and why Jesus came to this earth. The Bible says Philip opened his mouth. He preached the same scripture. He preached unto him Jesus, verse 36. And as Philip is preaching this message, and probably after he had explained to this man as best as he could about who Jesus was, verse 36 says, and as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It, the, the steps... It's belief, it's faith. The Bible teaches us then the next step is following the Lord in believer's baptism, water baptism. How did this man know about baptism? Without a doubt, Philip told him. Philip shared with this man the importance of following the Lord in believer's baptism. We've gone, in Christianity, we've gone to one, normally we go to extremes, and we've gone to extremes about baptism. 
We've got some denominations that teach that unless you're baptized, you're not saved. I would like to submit to you that there is no redemptive power in the water. The water cannot save a man of his sins. If the water could save a man of his sins, then there was no need for Jesus to die on the cross. The water cannot save a man of his sins. We've got some people who've gone to the extreme that says, well, you have to be baptized or you can't be saved. Yet, the majority, the bulk of Christianity is on this side that we've almost taken baptism out of the Bible. We act like it's no big deal. It's insignificant. I want to tell you something. The Lord himself instituted two things for the church to follow. One was communion, and the second was baptism. Jesus instituted both of those. Jesus commanded that those two ordinances be a part of the church. And the reason that Jesus gave those two things to the church is because they serve as a continuous, perpetual reminder to the church of what our salvation actually is. That's the importance of it. We call it believer's baptism. The man wanted to be baptized. Philip did not just automatically baptize him. Philip said, you can follow the Lord in baptism if you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, is the Savior of the world. And the man said, I believe with all my heart. I believe this. And Philip baptized this man. Why is being baptized in the name of Jesus so significant? Let me give you just two points. Number one, it's significant because it is a symbol of our salvation. There is no cleansing, redemptive power, as I've already said, in this water that comes out of a spigot. Yet, this, this being baptized, people who follow the Lord in believers' baptism, are, it's a symbol of really what does save them of their salvation. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 6. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Let me stop there just for a moment. The word Greek, the English word baptized comes from a Greek word, baptisma. When you say baptized, you're actually saying a Greek word. And people use the word baptisma or bapto or some form of it, baptizo, something like that. They used that word in common. The church did not invent that word, baptized. The church adapted, or Jesus adapted a word, and the church adapted a word, the baptized, baptizo, to represent something. What is baptizo? Probably the easiest to understand example of the way somebody would use this. If you had a piece of cloth and it was one color, and you wanted to change the color of that cloth into another color, how would you do that? Ladies, how do you change the color of a piece of cloth from one color to another color? What do you have to do? You have to dye it. How do, you, how do you dye it? Do you dye it by sprinkling a little dye on the top of it? And how do you dye a piece of cloth? You take a piece of cloth and you baptize it. That's the word. You immerse it. You submerge it. You plunge that piece of cloth into that solution so that when you bring that piece of cloth out, it brings with it the characteristics of that solution. As I've often told people, only God could take what is black and plunge it into what is red and bring it out white. That's what salvation is. And the Bible says salvation is that we are plunged, we are immersed into all that Jesus did here on this earth for us. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. The three steps of baptism, the person walks down into the water, they stand before the cross, they're symbolized and they're at this point. I once was dead in my sins. I have been crucified. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. When they took Jesus down from the cross, what did they do with him? What did they do with his dead body? They buried it. Is his dead body still in the ground? It was raised. And water baptism is the symbol of the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Water baptism is the symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of the believer. That's what he says. Know you not so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Water cannot wash away your sins. There's only one thing that can wash away your sins. What? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Look what it says in the book of Revelation. 
chapter 1, verse 5, unto him that loved us and washed us in his, our sins in his own blood. Water is a symbol of the sanctifying, cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. Water baptism is a physical symbol of this spiritual reality of what it means to actually be born again. And so that's why baptism is a very sacred thing. Baptism is, is, is a very sacred. Jesus commanded us to be baptized. Jesus himself was baptized. Why was Jesus baptized? Warren Wiersbe says that Jesus was baptized in order to signify that he was identifying himself with sinful men, and we as sinful men are baptized in order to signify that we identify ourselves with the Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord, we all meet there together in the shed blood of Christ. It's one, it's significant because it's a symbol of our salvation. It's declaring what our salvation is. Secondly, it's significant because it's a symbol of our surrender to it. Do you know what the Bible says in John chapter 6, I think it is, as Jesus, as Jesus was going out and preaching and winning people to the Lord, winning people to salvation. You know what his disciples were doing? The Bible says that they were baptizing people and making disciples. When we follow the Lord in believer's baptism, we are signifying we're to symbol of our surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and now that we now are one of his disciples. We are publicly declaring we believe in what Jesus did on the cross and we are committing ourselves to it. And we come out of that water. We are signifying, I confess, I profess that Jesus is Lord. I am one of his followers. I have been baptized in his name. That's what Jesus gave the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Notice what the Lord said. Go ye therefore and teach the word there. We studied that a few weeks ago. Disciple all nations. Make disciples. How do we make disciples? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Lord has commanded the church to baptize. The Lord has commanded Twin Oaks Baptist Church to go out and to reach people with the gospel and to baptize them in the name of Jesus. That is our commission. And then the Lord has commanded every person who accepts the Lord as their Savior then to submit themselves to that, surrender themselves to that, signifying that they indeed now are a disciple of the Lord. Verse 36. As they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? The man was excited. I want you to notice something here in the next two or three verses. The personal pronouns that pertain to this man. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou or if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It was a personal decision, and he wanted to declare that personal decision that he had made by publicly following the Lord in believer's baptism. The Bible says, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he immersed, submerged him there in the name of Jesus. I'll conclude by saying this. You know, really, it's significant also because it's, it's a source of celebration. Do you remember when you were baptized? How many of you remember the day you were baptized? I, you know, I was 12 years old. First time, I'd, I didn't even know they had water inside of a church that could baptize you. Tammy was baptized in the creek right there. She's tougher than I am. I was baptized, and, and I, I was 12 years old, and I remember that. I was, I've been short all my life, and I remember that water. I, like I had to kind of swim to Pastor Marshall. I was baptized that day. My brother's baptized that day. My dad was baptized that day. Paul Smith, you don't even know Paul Smith. He was baptized that day. Calvary Baptist Church, Radford, Virginia. Sunday afternoon, they opened up their church and let us baptize. Now listen, I don't walk on water. I am not perfect, but I've never forgotten that day. What a source of celebration it was. What a joy, what a relief. The Bible says in verse 39, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. But he, the eunuch, went on his way 
rejoicing. Heaven came down and joy. Don't you know what he was singing? Going down the road. He was probably throwing out his Ethiopian old music <laughs> and singing to God. He had a praise service, didn't he? Going home that day. Probably Candace was not actually the queen's name. That means the queen. Probably got there and she's like, what's got you so happy? Oh, what a wonderful joy has come into my heart since Jesus, you know. Him in my, he just, and God used this man. You want joy in your life. I look around and I see so many Christians. My pastor used to say most Christians look like a Missouri mule eating briars. <laughs> yeah, praise God. You want joy in your life? Let me tell you, have joy in your life. Number one, you need to know the Lord in a personal relationship through salvation. Number two, you need to yield to the Lord and follow Him in believer's baptism. Number three, you need to find a church that preaches the gospel and the truth, and you need to become a member of that church. Number four, you need to get involved in that church and begin to meet people. Number five, have Christian fellowship with them. Number six, have spiritual growth. And the result of that, a perfect seven will be you'll have spiritual joy. That's the steps to joy in your life. And I've yet to see a Christian have joy in their life that didn't follow those steps. Seriously. They got saved. They got baptized. They joined the church. They got involved. They got to know people. They fellowship with people. They started reading their Bible. They started praying. They started growing. And they have joy. And I believe that's what Jesus meant when he said, you know, you need to return to your first love. This is it, folks. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Can you say as the eunuch said, I believe? Have you been obedient to Him by being baptized in His name? Have you declared that He is your Master and that you are one of His disciples? Are you growing spiritually? Are you studying your Bible? Are you praying? Are you having fellowship with fellow believers? Are you an active member in the local church. Michelle, bring up Matthew 28 once again. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That was God's plan 2,000 years ago, and it's still God's plan today. And it will be God's plan until Jesus returns. Amen. Amen.